Precis sånt kan man göra. Eh, jag ska bara ställa in ljudet och det, nu är det på väg i alla fall. Så vi testar lite och ser om ljudet verkar ju vara väldigt, väldigt högt just nu. Så vi... Och så nu får ni vara tysta faktiskt. Är det bara tyst? Ja, det går nog bra. Okej, okay, we're testing sound. So I haven't got any sound or do, can you hear me? Great. Okay. We're close to start. Uh, so I'm just gonna record this session uh, in two different ways. So um, just another minute. And I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen now, right? Or it did not work. Yeah. Great. Okay, so, hi everyone, my name is Daniel Toll, very pleased to be here. We have a large class and some of you noticed that I'm not speaking Swedish, right? Uh, I actually can speak Swedish, uh, so it's the main language for this class is going to be English, uh, for the benefit of students who are only speaking English or have um, are taking this class as an English class. Yes, um, so where to begin? So I'm a programmer. I've been programming since I was a kid. I have um, really love programming. Uh, I started about when I was 11, 12 years old. I wanted to be a game programmer for a very long time and I did a little bit of game programming programming together with Tobias that some of you have seen just right now, right? And I'm oh, it's slightly confusing to have many computers, right? I'm your examiner, main lecturer and tutor. And um, I do some research also in computer science education and um, I'm interested in code quality. What does it mean for code to be good or bad? What does it mean for you students to encounter code that is good or bad? And um, stuff like that. I'm also uh, involved in programming for kids. So tonight I'm going for a, a a coder dojo ses session, dojo, 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 yeah, uh, session, uh, where we get a bunch of kids from age seven to seventeen. Uh, that is, oh, they want to learn programming, and we try to do that in some kind of um, fun and creative way. So I really love programming. I want to share that love with you guys. And we're going to do a lot of programming together in this course. So I'm just going to check that. So it's still, you can still hear me, right? The sound is very bad. Okay. So maybe I need to set up the sound again. <laughs> yeah, that is so cool, right? Infinite mirror effect. You guys want to see, okay, too much microphone boost if you got that on. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can change that. It might, um, yeah, the microphone might be a bit close, right? But, 
unfortunately, the uh, applications today, we have a lot of applications when we broadcast such a uh, lecture. So I have several computers are involved and several servers are involved in such a lecture. Uh, so there will be a few problems, um, especially with Adobe Connect. <coughs> So I'm going to try to restart Adobe Connect now and see if we can get it to work again, hopefully with better sound. Oh, much better already. Oh, then we don't restart. OK. So um, I was the programming love guy. And who are you? You're my teaching assistant, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, I'm Andreas. Uh, I'm also a student here. I'm in the class for year three. Everyone in this classroom I already met and bugged all last year. Uh, try to help you as much, much as possible. Students in the camera, I will see you maybe sometime in Vic uh, and help you online. But my job here is just to help you guys with your assignments and make sure that you learn as much as possible. In this class, I won't be grading you or pass-failing you or any of your exams or anything like that. So I'm just here to help, and I want to help you as much as possible so you learn as much as possible. Great. So you're the good guy, right? Yeah. I'm the grading guy. I've always been mad at him. Don't blame me for anything. That's Great. The so it's awesome to have you here. And you've, you've taken the course also last year, right? Yes. So did you learn anything? I learned tons. Tons? Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, I used to program PHP before. I did it for work for a couple of years. But even though with a couple of years of experience of PHP, this course gave a lot of time to evolve, even if you already know the language. You can dig deeper into the little details about everything. And in the project, your last assignment, you can do whatever you want. So then it's up to you, like how much do you want to learn? Do you want to just do something simple and pass, or do you want to evolve? So that's up to you. Yeah. It's, it's um, depending on how much you put into it, right? How much you learn. OK, hopefully we're going to learn a lot. And every year that I give this course, I learn a lot also. So we're just going to uh, have a quick run through through the course. and. Um, Yeah. So I moved the microphone a little bit more. Maybe you hear me better <coughs> now. Yes. OK, first things first. I want you all, you, uh, all of you to make sure that you're properly registered for the course. If you're not, email me today, and we will fix things. Uh, there are some prerequisites that you need to fulfill in order to be um, part of this course. And it's 30 points of computer science and then you have some courses, right? Uh, if you have maybe um, one assignment or something like that in one of those courses, it's probably OK. But you email me and ask, right? Then I will give you my judgment. Yeah, that computer. OK, the goal is to give you guys a second language for the server, or your first language for the server for some. So we're going to use PHP. Uh, we're going to use version 5.2 plus. That means it de depends on what kind of server you're aiming to release your applications on. So you can decide if you want to use a higher version, but not a lower version than 5.2. So you're going to learn this language. And the learning of the language is going to go really quick, because uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on teaching you guys every intricate detail of PHP. The main objective in this course is programming, and not programming PHP. Um, PHP is just a language. Hopefully, you can use what you learn in this course in any language. Right? And in fact, next year, we're going to 
remove the PHP part from this course, and next year it's going to be like software quality or something, introduction to software quality. Um, but actually that name could be a better name for this course. Um, we're going to talk about what is good code, how can we manage to write larger projects, how can we manage to um, share code with other programmers, what tools should we be using, how should we make sure that the application that we're developing is working correctly, how do we test things, how do we approach security in web applications, and how do we make sure that um, my future employer that is that has been uh, looking at my GitHub account uh, wants to hire me. That is the course goals, more or less. There are, there are some other things. You can check them up in the um, syllabus. OK, the course web page, you've seen them before. Uh, so please check the course web page. There are some. Um, some pages on this one. Some of, some of the assignments are still developed, and some are going to be released a little bit later. Uh, but check the course web page. Um, there's a lot of information there that has been written this year. So there are probably a lot of mistakes and spelling mistakes and stuff like that. I've translated much of the course material, so it, and I've just like hammered the keyboard translation version, right? Not really the, the Google Translate thingy, but, but almost as bad. So there probably will be things where you, OK, oh my god, I can't read this, or I cannot understand this. And then you tell me, right? Uh, most of the content is on GitHub, uh, so you can actually uh, change it and then ask me to, to incorporate your changes, right? Um, the goal is that most of the material of the course, or all material of the course, should be available online, even if you're not taking this course, and even after you've taken this course. Um, yes. There are actually four assignments, and then one workshop and one project, and you get you have to get approved on each and every one of these to get a grade in this course, right? Um, so the first four assignments is free uh, credits, I think, and the project and the workshop is 4.5 credits. <coughs> Two of the assignments is going to be uh, automatically assessed, the first and the third one. Uh, in a tool called CS Quiz, Computer Science Quiz. It's really a, just a tool that I've written that enables you to try out PHP, write code, and um, uh, yeah, complete assignments. So uh, assignment one and assignment three is, is going to be in CS Quiz. And of course, you find the links here. And down here you have this personal link to CS Quiz. So that would enable you to try it out. OK. And the second uh, assignment is also available. So you can start with it now if you want to. The third assignment is going to, um, uh, we're going to wait a few days until we release that one, until the first assignment's deadline is over. You can also find all the, the deadlines for all the assignments here under deadlines. So please check that document and see that, um, make sure that you make notes of these dead deadlines. Since we have six different assignments, really, four assignments and one project and one workshop, and you have to be approved in every one of those, make sure you put these in your calendar, right? And start early and, and um, Make sure to start even this week, I would say. I would say a good goal would be to, to uh, complete assignment one this week. You should be able to do that. Uh, and 
maybe start with ever with assignment two, perhaps during the weekend or something like that. Even if the deadline is a bit longer, right? So we only have nine weeks. I've crammed a lot of content in those nine weeks, a lot of assignments. Nine weeks, six assignments, right? Six deadlines in nine weeks. So thank you, okay, I'm, I must probably make room for this project. Uh, yeah. I can give a little heads up here. Uh, from last year, all my classmates said that this was one of the most time consuming classes of these first two years of the program. So this class takes a lot of time. So be prepared that it will take you these like about 20 hours a week. You will need them. Uh, you get a little bit of a soft, soft start, but it's very time consuming. So be prepared that it will take time and don't get frustrated if you feel that it's consuming a lot of your time because it probably will. Mm. Yeah, so the main focus of this class is to make you programmers. And to become a programmer, you need practical experience of programming. And that is hard work, right? And it's also fun. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, so I hope that you will spend around 20 hours a week um, for programming. For a lot of people, that wasn't enough. Some people yeah. spent yeah. like 30, 40 hours a week and was super frustrated. Yeah. So that was not enough for everyone. Yeah. So um, yeah, start early not two days before the deadline. OK, I've got two questions. Uh, are we allowed to use PHP 7? Uh, I would use the 5.6, I think. And I also got a question on namespaces in 5.2. Yes, they are not introduced in 5.2. But you're allowed to use 5.2. That means namespaces are optional. I'm going to show them, I'm going to use them, and if you're using 5.2, you have to remove that code. Right. Yes. OK. We're going to be using a lot of tools. Uh, Git and GitHub. You need an account on GitHub in order to submit your solutions for assignment 2 and 4 and the project, and probably also the, the workshop. Uh, you need a local web server installed on your machine. I don't care how you do it. It's some clues under on the course web under tools. Uh, yeah, here. And you also need a public web server. So you need some kind of account on a public web server. You can start this server yourself if you have an openly available IP address. Um, you can buy a from a web hotel or something like that, or you can use some p free PHP hosting. So I've, um, there is at least one free, free PHP hosting that I've tried these assignments on. So that yeah. um, I'm probably going to show it to you later. So you need this public web server for the first assignment, no, for the second assignment and for the fourth assignment and for the project. Because you need to, to make a um, uh, release version of your application that we are able to test online. Yes. So a little bit of what I call plumbing. You know, plumbing, when you're working with pipes and stuff and put st stuff together, not only to develop these programs, but to deploy them, right? Make them available. You can choose whatever IDE or development tools you like. For the first and third assignment, we're using this CS quiz, so you will be programming directly into the browser. So you can start today, right? Um, otherwise, I use Sublime. Uh, there are better tools. Uh, Many students like PHP Storm. You can use whatever you like. Um, yeah, there's, there are grades. And we have, there are requirements for these grades. Hopefully, these requirements will be really clear to you. I've made an effort to 
write down how I'm going to judge if what, what, kind of, what kind of grade you're going to get. But for some of the assignments, assignment one and three, they're just pass-fail. For the work, workshop, is just pass-fail. For assignment two and four and the project, there will be grading. Right. So uh, I've just written a few things here. There will be some minimum requirements. If you do not uh, submit the version of your application to me, I cannot judge it. Then you will just fail, right? Uh, if you're not, uh, if I cannot access the code on GitHub, you just fail since I cannot judge, right? Then there will be some requirement fulfillments for these assignments, like okay, do does your your uh, application fulfill a requirement or not? That would be some kind of percentage, right? And um, some of these re requirements will be mandatory, so that you can choose. Uh, no, you cannot choose. You must fulfill all these requirements. And some of these requirements will be extra. So you can, you can do them for extra credit or higher grade, right? Um, and then I will uh, make an effort and read your code and think, OK, is this good code or is it bad code? Right, so you will get a grading on code quality. And also on architecture implementation. Yeah. Almost the same things will be for the project, but uh, for the project, the requirements is up to you, right? So that part, you decide. Okay, you, you will decide what the project will do or not. Um, there will be some restrictions. We're, you're not allowed to use uh, frameworks. You're not uh, allowed to use any uh, um, uh, code written by others. You must write everything yourself, stuff like that. Yeah, the deadline's quite tough in this course. I said there were six deadlines. Um, if you do not submit before the deadline, or if you do not pass the assignment on the deadline, we will have no resubmissions. You will get a new assignment. So it's like a, a home exam, hempenta, right? <coughs> because on the uh, examination, we were going to show you one solution with all the extra credits, right? And we're going to be doing a lot of discussion. So, um, yeah. So make sure you, you are uh, approved um, before the deadline. Yeah. We have done some changes from last year. Um, Andreas, you have helped me uh, develop a tool that will hopefully help you with assignment two and four uh, by uh, letting you uh, check if you fulfill these requirements. So you can be a little bit more like sure in your, or safe, right? So uh, please check that out on assignment two. Yeah. I will post changes and stuff on the course web and those changes will also be uh, presented on Slack, right? Uh, so you please join Slack, and you need a uh, account on Slack. So make sure you submit or uh, register for an account on Slack. But you guys are here in, on campus. Calmer is already using Slack, right? Right. Yes. Personal information is sent to me by email. I think that is most of it, and I'm going to check for questions. <coughs> so resubmission should be the name for completing, yeah. Any questions on the course format? Sounds OK? Going to be a lot of fun. Going to be a lot of programming.
Andreas writes that PHP Storm is free one year if you use your student mail account for licensing. Is it possible to go in CS Quiz in and out as you want? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can use that link as many times as you want. Yes. As long as you're logged into uh, CoursePress, you should be able to access them. OK. So regarding CS Quiz, um, please read the instructions before you start. And I will ask you if you want to uh, join a computer science experiment, or not really an experiment, but um, uh, that I'm, um, CS Quiz does a recording of what you do in it, so that I can measure how long it takes for you guys to complete one assignment. And it does so anonymously. So I don't know that it's you who has taken three minutes for the first assignment, or six minutes, or one hour and 10 seconds, or something like that. But it's really important for me, as a, as a computer science, science scientist, to understand how students learn how to program. So for me, it's gold if you join this. So you will be presented with a question if you want to uh, allow me to use this information in my uh, in my studies uh, as a PhD student, or not. And you can choose n not to, and it's totally OK for me, right? But please do, right? Um, does not record anything outside the browser, but it records everything that you write inside the browser. So do not put any personal information into that, right? Like a bank account number uh, or something like that. I'm not interested in that. You don't need to write your name or anything in, in CS Quiz. Yes. So it looks like this. We have all the tasks. You can start tasks. And these are your completed tasks. And there are yeah, uh, 11 tasks for assignment one. So. Most of the tasks are designed to be quite quick. You can um, probably go through most of these in a couple of hours. Uh, the, the last task will take a little more time, probably. Yes, not for everyone, but for some. Yes, but um, last year, I think the amount of time spent on these first assignments was around 10 hours on average. Um, yeah. Any questions regarding CS quiz? Great. So that was the course introduction. Thank you, Andreas, for attending. Thank you. And we're going to start talking about. Start learning. Start learning, yeah. Hang on a couple of seconds. Just gonna make sure that I can. So I think that it's probably a good idea to take a break, right? Yeah. So 10 minutes. OK, so let's start with the second part, or the first, first lecture, really. So I'm going to start about um, showing you guys this image. It's a pipeline. Uh, I'm not that big a fan of the oil industry, uh, but a pipeline 
is a device where you pump up oil in one location, then you want to transport this oil to another location, right? So you push in or pump in oil into this pipeline that's just a long pipe, and then it comes out in the other end, right? Some, some other place, and you can use that, that oil. So it's the same thing with communication over the internet. So we have some producer of information that pushes a lot of bits of information into some kind of device that moves this information to another location. So if this was the first bit that was entered, it will also be the first bit that comes out. So just like the oil pushed in into this pipeline, it will come out in the same order as we put it in, right? So the first oil pushed in to the pipeline will be the first oil to come out. First in, first out. So some producer of information pushes things into the pipeline information and some consumer of information receives these bits. And after a while, oh, I need another bit here. So like that. Now I got eight bits. Now these, ha these two guys, the producer and consumer, has to um, agree on a way to interpret these bits. A common way would be to say that eight bits of information is one byte, right? So this could mean a number, perhaps. Does anyone know what, what number that is? Anyone has a uh, binary calculator? This means one, right? This means two, this means four, this means eight, and we don't have that. This means 16, we don't have 32, 64. And then you just add these numbers. Anyone quick in math? Not this early in the semester. <laughs> no. Oh, 87, yeah. So this means 87, right? But for the, for the consumer, he must know that we're supposed to interpret these bits of information, and he has to wait for eight bits until he interprets it as a number, 87, right? And then he needs to interpret what that number means. So what is 87? Is it number of students in this class, perhaps? Or is it a uh, alphabetic character, perhaps? So in some way, he needs to translate these things into something meaningful. And these two guys need to agree on this. So one common thing would be to use some kind of table to translate from bits of information into some kind of thing that we want. So like text, for instance. So a pipeline can be used to yeah, move this one. push information from one computer to another. And the magical device on a computer or in the um, network programming world is called sockets. A socket is like a telephone. And in order to call a socket, you need a phone number, right? And that is, consists of two parts. The first part is an IP address. So I must know which computer am I going to call? So I need some kind of IP address. And then I need to know what program on that computer am I going to talk to. 
because a computer can have a lot of different calls going on to get, uh, going on at the same time. So we can have a computer that is talking with me and talking to you and talking to another guy at the same time. So if we have a web server, this web server can serve a lot of different clients at the same time. So in order to know uh, how to speak with this web server, I must know the web server's IP address, and I must know the port or the program that I'm going to talk to. Right. So the most common thing would be if I'm going to talk to web server, to talk to port port 80, yeah. So, yeah. And then, when I have an open port to the web server, I can ask the web server for the kind of information that I want. But I must make, make myself understood. I want to see the funny picture of the cat, or the, the video of the cat, or I want to see my emails, something like that. So there's some communication going on there, and they're going to use these translation tables that we talked about, like the ASCII table or UTF8, uh, yeah, slow translator. Um, So you can read about how these things work. And it's quite important to know how these things work when you're working with PHP. Because PHP is much lower, lower level than like uh, ASP.NET. So when you're doing a PHP application, it becomes a bit more important to understand these things. And it's the basics for all communication. So, in order to ask the server for either the cat video or my emails, I must know how to talk with the, with, the, with the server. So we need some kind of way of saying things. I need the cat video, please. And that way of saying things in these bits of information is called HTTP. And that is a protocol, a protocol for talking. So. And I'm going to show you how to make an HTTP request. That is, I, I request some, some information from the server. And HTTP looks like this. It's just text. I write, OK, I want the file index.php. I'm talking this protocol. And then I say, OK, I'm uh, HTTP tool. I've taken this example from the address up here. I recommend that you check out this um, e HTTP made really easy tutorial. It's really interesting. It's the basis for all web programming, so please check it out. Uh, the normal thing would be to speak HTTP 1.1. And in a few years, uh, I'm not sure, but in a few years, we're going to start speaking HTTP 2. There was a new version of HTTP that was released, or I don't know if it's a release candidate or not, uh, in December last year. So, um, But it's much e easier to talk HTTP 1.0. Then I only need to specify these things. Get index.php and the version of PHP, uh, HTTP. And then uh, on the end here, I do two carriage returns. Uh, and then, hopefully, the server speaks the same protocol as I, and then that server will answer, okay, I have this file for you. It was written 16 years ago. It has this length, 14 characters. It contains text, HTML text, and here is the contents. Then I get the HTML page back. OK.
So I'm going to talk to CS Quiz now. And I'm not going to use port 80 because it's not used um, for that. So I'm going to talk to port 81 in this case. It's just another web server. And so now I have an open channel to the web server. It's like opening up the phone yeah, or starting a call. So I have a call going on. And um, I'm talking to CS Quiz because most servers shut down these calls really fast. If I'm not using it, if I'm not communicating, oh, they're sh shut down, right? So I'm not allowed to use the server's resources or the open phone lines for a long time. So we're going to restart that, and then we're going to ask for index.php, and we're going to say that we're talking HTTP 1. And then I have two carriage return, and then I get an answer. So I got an answer, and it was a bad request. So I failed somewhere. Uh, what did I fail? So we're going to see here. Uh, so that was what I written, and this is starts the reply. It says that okay, you you're talking something that is crap, um, and I don't understand that, and I don't like that. So I shut down. I get a, a message back that says that okay, it's a bad request. So let's try that again. Uh, not sure what I did wrong, but. I think maybe I need to ask for like that. Anyone see any errors? Please. Oh, here it is. So now I get an answer. So probably did something wrong. I don't know what I did. <clears throat> but I got an answer. And this time it says that, OK, I know that you're talking HTTP 1.0, but as a server, I'm not talking that old crap. Uh, so I'm talking 1.1, and I have the page for you. It's 200 OK. That means I got the page for you. Uh, and then I got some information. And this information is called headers. So these headers contain some kind of information what the header is, and then some information about the header, header, header content, and then a carriage return in the end. So we can see that, OK, there's a date. Uh, what the server is called. Apparently, we're using Apache. Apache. Uh, we say, see that the server wants to set a cookie in me, right, into the client. Wants to set a cookie into the client. A PHP session ID and some cookie content and a path for that cookie. It says that this cookie will expire at a certain date. It will tell me how to talk to this server how much cash, um, and it will set another few cookies, or actually it will remove those cookies. But, and then after that, there's two carriage returns, and then the content of the file that I requested comes. And before it sends that content, it says that, OK, it's 977 characters long. It's text, so it's not an image or anything like that, or a video of a cat. And then comes the content. And this content and the headers up there is what we are creating with PHP. So here comes the HTML. So HTTP is a communication protocol that allows me to access HTML or images or CSS or JavaScript or cat videos. Stuff like that. Make sense? Nothing magic going on. Just text communication. OK. So yeah, first, maybe we want to do this. We want to talk to that um, address by a, a browser instead. You can see that the browser, I input the same address up here, 
with a colon and port 81, the same address, and then I get the HTML rendered for me, right? And probably we're going to see that this page has at least one cookie. Oh, it has a lot of cookies. But the cookie that I set right now, because I've been using this web page before, so there's a lot of cookies here. Uh, the cookie that, that this page set was the PHP session ID cookie. Yes. <clears throat> OK. So let's ask my local web server for a page. I did, did not find it. I receive a 404 not found. I'm asking for the wrong file. Or in fact, it does not exist right now. So something is wrong. And what is wrong is that I have not created that file. So that is probably a good idea. So let's do that. So I save a file called index.php. Going back to my browser. Reload. Fantastic. Our first PHP program. Not a single character outputted, but it says that, OK, I've got this content. It's zero characters long. Here you go. So let's put some PHP code here. So PHP starts with this tag up there. It's called a PHP tag. And probably now you can see it, right? And let's put out some content. So and now you can see the content, right? So it's rendered there. So PHP, in this case, um, receives the requests from Apache, the server, and um, executes its PHP script. PHP is not a compiled language. It is an, an interpret, interpreted script language. This means that it's not pre-compiled, like you did with the C Sharp or Java, that you pre-compile something and get an executable out of it, which can be run. But the PHP script is actually interpreted directly when I access it. And um, at that time, it is parsed for errors. And at that time, it is run. That means that things that you've pre in previous languages, like Java or C Sharp, errors that you've found or the compiler could find for you uh, will not be found in PHP until we test it. And in some cases, these errors will not occur until we step into the right if, uh, if statement or for loop and, and actually execute the line with the error in it. This means that testing is really important in, when programming in PHP. OK. So I'm using a web server called Apache, right? We could see that. And I'm using a, a tool called Vagrant in order to run Apache on my computer without polluting everything else. Have you heard about Vagrant? Anyone? Uh, it's a really good thing that I'm not going to talk about <laughs> much. But try to find out Vagrant. Um, it's a way of running virtual servers on your machine. Uh, and you can keep things that um, is only related to one project. If we go back to my, and you check the, my programming, uh, you can see that I'm, I'm currently involved in like 20 projects or something like that. And each of these projects may need a server. 
that may, be, may need configuration. And Vagrant solves that for me so that I can have a spawn server for each of these. But there are many ways of starting servers. If you just download PHP itself, it can be a server. Uh, there is a document telling us, or telling you guys, one way of doing this. And it's very modest, called PHP the right way. And one of the first things that it tells us is how to get started, right? So check this document, phptherightway.com. Uh, it will tell you how to get started. Um, maybe not the vagrant stuff, but really, um, it's a really good thing to learn these things. To, to be able to start your own tools, to be able to, to debug things, and to be able to set up your environment that you're going to work in. And if you're going to work with PHP, you probably have to do this. It's a lot of manual stuff. But there is a lot of good guys out there, a good community around PHP that uh, produces tons of tutorials for different tools. Right. Yeah. OK, I said that PHP is an interpreted script language. It is hated and loved. And this sort of sums up what I think about PHP. I, I hate it, and I love it. It's uh, so awful and so great at the same time. Just This is just personal opinions, right? But what? Um, or some of it might be not so personal. It's huge on the server side. There is a lot of sites, like 100 million or something like that, that is using PHP. 81.3%, if you, if you can trust this source, of the web servers is using this. Um, it's really easy to deploy. So if I were given a new, to, new um, computer, fresh from the store, I could probably produce a new website, online available, uh, probably not the best website, but I could do that without much more than an internet connection. And I could probably get going online the same day, or in a couple of hours, just because it's so easy to deploy. It's really easy to put up on the server. You just need to upload your files and then run it, right? Because it's a script language. You don't even need to compile it. It's got a really fast development time. But unfortunately, as I hope that you will encounter, that um, if you're not careful, um, this will uh, lead to <clears throat> applications that are hard to manage. It's very easy to do. Full hack, ugly hacks. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of great communities around PHP, a lot of great um, frameworks and libraries, and people putting a lot of effort in creating resources for you guys that you're not allowed to use in this course. But um, you can listen to their lectures, and you can look at their examples, and you can get inspired by that. Um, some, of the, some of the downside, according to me, uh, is that it's weakly typed. I'm more into strongly typed languages like Java or C Sharp or C++ or stuff like that. Um, it has type hinting. PHP 7 uh, actually has return types also. Um, PHP is a bit slow. Uh, PHP 7 is supposed to solve this also. Um, for number crunching, I would say. Stuff that if you're going to um, create a video, you would not be using PHP. It would take forever compared to like uh, C++ or something like that. Uh, it's hard to manage for larger applications. So it's a good language to learn the value of code quality in. And um, yeah, 
wrong computer again. Okay, next part. We're going to talk about, before we even started with PHP, we're going to talk about architecture. I've said that one of the goals was to let you write larger applications. I don't know how large applications you've encountered, but uh, in 2009, around a couple of years before and a couple of years after, I did a bit of game programming. Really small games, um, you know, online available, downloadable games for PC or for Windows, stuff like that. And even these simple games contained like a hundred classes, thousands of lines of code, maybe around 10,000 lines of code in my game project and maybe around 15,000 lines of code in, in the game engine or something like that and perhaps a few thousand of lines of code that I've imported from some other uh, thing. So that kind of project, it's not that big. I think that, or I believe that like Windows, the operating system of Windows or um, it's millions and millions of lines of code. In order to write an application that is more than like 10 classes, we need good strategies to keep down the complexity in this code, and we need good strategies to learn how to find your way through this code. So for me, I see an architecture as a map of the code says to me where to put things and where to find things. It is a guide for me when I design my program. And it allows me to reuse ideas that I've, that I've had before, or ideas by someone else. So it's really, the architecture is really more or less constraints on me. Constraints like rules of things I'm not allowed to do. And rules where to place things, and rules where to not place things. So it helps me to keep down the solution space of possible solutions for my problem. This is a bit abstract, right? So how can solution space uh, be um, Smaller or larger? Hang on a second. Let's say we are going to write a program that is going to present the text Hello World on the screen. Right? You've seen it today. So that program is one instance of programs that cre can create a hello world. Then I can, it was this one, right? You recognize it? I can create another program, right? That um, does the same thing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you do not recognize it because it's behind that ugly other window. So now we just entered two more um, lines of code here, did nothing, right? But I've got a new program that does these things. Uh, I can write another line of code like this, if, and then I write uh, just true, something like that. I'm really stupid right now, so. And I'm going to the browser and just check that it works. Oh, it works. It's the same thing, right? So we can have several programs doing the same thing. Go another one here. Ah, another third one, right? That was the one with the two uh, character turns. So if we think of all the programs in the world, possible programs, Some of these programs are better than others. Perhaps the one with the if statement and the if, if true uh, is not as good as the, the other one, right? So we could have a, a rule or a constraint on our programming that says that you should not put unnecessary if statements 
into your code, right? I don't remember which one. So if we say that, OK, you're not allowed to put unnecessary if statement in your code, you cut away all the solutions that contain such if statements. Right. Then we can have other constraints. You're not supposed to have uh, files that are more than 1,000 lines long to produce Hello World. <laughs> You're not allowed to uh, use curse words. Yeah, stuff like that. And in the end, you get a set of programs, hopefully, better than those around that we cut away. So in the same way, we, uh, we can do with architecture. And architecture helps us to do that. So it says, that, OK, not only that you're not allowed to, to do certain stupid things in your code, but where to put things. So that becomes a constraint also. And that will help other programmers, and perhaps your future self, to find code again. Yes. So can we agree that this can be worthwhile to learn? So let's check out a architecture for computer programs called Model View Controller. This is just Wikipedia. Um, this is created um, probably before most of us was born by Trygve Reineskog. And he did this Reineskog um, in the 70s, a little bit earlier than I was born, right? And he had a bit different view than, than me. And he said that, OK, we can divide our program into different parts. And these different parts can have different responsibilities, different components. And they are, like the pattern says, model, a view, and a controller. So it says that, OK, let's put things that are business rules, rules that apply for our business. Uh, that could be like um, let's say you have a simple game called Pong. Do you know Pong? Raise your hand if you know Pong. Awesome. Maybe online also? Thank you. So one rule in Pong is that if the ball in Pong hits one of the walls, let's have Pong. There are four walls. There's a line in the middle. You control this pad, and there is a ball bouncing here. So one of the rules will be that in every step, this ball is moving. So in a second or something like that, the, the ball has moved to a new location. If that ball hits the top or bottom wall, it will bounce. That is a rule. right? Another rule would be that if the ball hits the pad, it will bounce. That is the second rule. Third rule would be if the ball does hit the left and right walls, we will score, and a new game will start. Right? Something like that. So these are business rules. It does not matter how or what on what screen you play Pong. Uh, in a, let's say, a web store, these rules could be that if a user has a certain number of items in their uh, shopping basket, they can uh, have uh, a discount, for instance. Or uh, we're going to uh, count the number of items in the shopping basket and sum up the price for each item into a total price. 
and that total price should be paid if you want to pay for this, right? That is another business rule. It does not change if your um, if your web store gets a new uh, appearance, or if you're shopping on your cell phone, or shopping on online, or if you go to the shop. It's actually the same rules, right? So business rules are the underlying rules for this business. OK, that was the model. Then we have a controller. And I, th this is quite not 100% orthodox. Uh, but I, you have heard about um, requirements, right? You have heard about uh, use cases. Perhaps you've written a couple of use cases. I make uh, almost an equal sign between controller and a use case. So maybe we have a shopping controller. And maybe we have a play pong controller. And the controller says, or regulates, what happens in the program. So it's sort of a couple of if statements. If the user wants to do this, and they are allowed to use, do this, allowed to do that was a model rule, right? If the user wants to do this, then OK, let's do this. So if the user wants to move the pad, let's move the pad. If the user wants to move the pad, but the pad is on the top of the screen and cannot move, OK, we cannot move. So the controller checks the kind of input from the user and executes that in, in changes in the model. So we can buy things, and we can um, play the game, and stuff like that. And then we have the view. That is the third part. The view presents things to the user. The output that we created uh, is done by the view. So this little line that I've written in my program here should only be written in a view, since I actually write it to the user. We see that line. So all HTML, all CSS, all JavaScript is generated by views. All the output, all the cookies we set, all the uh, headers that we set in the HTTP protocol, uh, the URL that we uh, make the users write, the URLs that we create in links in our applications, they are created by views. So all output. And then all input is handled through the view. That is also a bit controversial. But in the version of MVC that you're going to use and be judged on using, the constraints that I put on you in this course will be like that. So the view will, will um, translate output from the user into, uh, uh, that is our application's input, right? Output from the user. User pushes things through this pipe, comes up to the server, and the server should interpret those, or the view should interpret those uh, characters into something that, that is, is uh, recognizable for our controller. So it should create a higher level of input from lower level of input. Uh, the input The input from the user could be, the IP address could be considered the input from the user. Yes, yes. yes. That, that is something that could be like changed from a user. So everything that a user can affect, like an IP address, a user could go to another computer or a user create can fake their IP address. Everything like that must go for the view. So I've said that modern view controller can be, or the version of modern view controller is not, uh, that, that we're going to use is not the only one. Uh, just to make a point. Let's just Google model view controller and check the images. And you can see there's a lot of diagrams here, right? And there's a lot of arrows. Arrows. 
right? So people interpret this pattern in different way, put different responsibilities in these things. I hope to be very clear on what you're going to put in these different requirements, um, or in dif different components, I mean. OK. Uh, wrong computer again. Yeah. So I said that the view contains the input and output of our application. It actually works as a layer between our application and a user or a browser. So our users are happy because we keep them safe and provide them with valuable applications, right? Our user provides input to our application through their browser with HTTP. Get me that cat image or video. We have a view or several view classes that takes this input and creates a higher level input to our controller. So I'm actually going to write it that way. The controller is going to ask, what does the user want? The user wants the cat image. So the controller can ask the view. Does the user want the cat image like that, or something like that? Or does the user want to buy these items in the shopping basket, or something like that? That is higher level input, not these bit streams of HTTP. It's more like logic or abstract on the controller. So the view can hide these really itty bitty uh, gritty things from HTTP hides that the user is using HTTP at all. And then um, we want to produce a res uh, res response to the, to the uh, client. So the controller that contains or has access to the model does that. It provides the view with the information it needs. And the view sends HTML through HTTP or images or whatever, a video or whatever, containing information from the model. So this is the kind of uh, applications that we're going to write. So we're going to write view classes that is communicating directly directly with the user. We're going to create controller classes that asks the view what the user wants and perhaps changes things in the model. And we're going to create model classes that encapsulates and represents these domain rules. Okay. Before we check that out, um, yeah, I've already said these things, really. Yeah. So let's let's uh, look at a view class.
like that. So I just created a new file. It's called HTML view. And we, we're going to put some code in it. But at first, I'm going to, from the index file, try to tell you guys how I want this class to work. So it's a view class. And I required it. It means that I say that, OK, you're going to load that class. And you're going to interpret that class or that file. And you're going to handle whatever code that it's in that file. So this require once is the way to include things in PHP. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things that can be said about that. But and then we're going to create an instance of that class. So we create a, a HTML view. And we're going to say that, OK, this view is going to talk with a character set called UTF-8. And something is wrong with the communication here. Somewhere. It's not sharing what I wanted to share. Do we have any access to the online students? Can you still hear me? Oh, great. Um, OK. See if it comes back. No, it does not. See if we can get it working again. Oh, I just lost the internet connection on my computer. Awesome. So we say we configure this instance of the class with some string. It says UTF-8. And then we're going to use that class. So um,
and I, I just want to create an HTML document. So I'm going to send it a title that will be presented up um, on the uh, tabs in the browser, and I will send it a body that will be hello world. But this time, I don't want it to just be, be the string hello world. I just want it to be a, a proper HTML document, right? So the class HTML view is going to encapsulate that we're going to talk HTML, right? Because that is the language that the browser is using. So I send it the title, hello. And then I send it a body, hello world. And let's put a header around that also. Like that. So, and then I, I expect a proper HTML page to show up in my browser. That, that is my expectant. OK, right now it will not show up since did I even save it? Should say that it contains no clause, but it probably does not show the error message at all. This is one problem with interpreted languages and uh, PHP in s especially, that if we, get, if we do something that is wrong, we won't know. Uh, and me in many of the cases, we just get blank pages. Uh, so we need to turn on errors in order to see this error. But I thought that I had already done that. So, um, let's see if things. Yeah, that worked at least. That will tell the PHP interpreter to show errors. So that, that small line of code. This, these things should be really be set up in your server instead of doing this in every script. Um, yeah. OK, let's see if we can get an error out. Yeah. So now. The PHP interpreter knows that we want to see errors. And sees that, OK, there is no class called view HTML view. So let's create that class really quick by copying from the prepared classes. So the first line up here is the namespace. A namespace allows me to separate different, comp different classes into different components. And this component that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm currently creating is the view component. Then I have a class declaration and a class name. And we can see that this class has a constructor. The constructor is called whenever we create an object. You've probably seen them in C Sharp and in Java, hopefully. And they are used to configure objects of a class. So I configure my object of the HTML view class by sending it a, a character set. I want you to use UTF-8 and not ANSI whatever, um, ASCII stump, something something. So use this car character set. And I do this configuration by setting a state in this class. A state is a member variable of the class. 
So you've probably seen this member variable of other clauses in other languages, right? And this, this, shows that I'm using a member variable. You did not have to use that in C Sharp and in, and in Java, even if you know that this exists in those languages also. But in PHP, you need to write this and then an arrow. It means that the member variable character set is in this object of this class. And we set that to the a variable that is sent as an argument to this method. So the value UTF-8 that I sent into the constructor when I created an, an instance of the object, of the class, uh, will be set into the character set of this member variable of this object. Yeah. So the constructor. Uh, PHP is a bit, mm, let's say that object orientation in PHP is built on top of a non-object oriented PHP. So it's sort of ad hoc added. This is one of the things that I don't like, but it's, we have to live with it if we're going to be programming in PHP. There are things like you cannot have two constructors in PHP. Maybe in PHP 7, I don't know, but not in regular PHP. Um, and then we have one method, get HTML page that we're going to call. And this method is actually creating a string for us. So taking two strings, the first one was the title, the hello that I sent, that is going to be presented on top of the page. And the second one was the HTML body. And then I create this string. And you can see that I've used two types of string concatenation in PHP. String concatenation it means that I build up a string from other strings. So I have a string called title. I have a string called body. And then I introduce both the title, here it is, and the body into a larger strings that begin here and ends here. And I also include the member variable that was part of the character set. So I build up a, a new string. And then I return that string. It's a typical application of a view. Create a string. Create a HTML string. Yes. So let's see if we can get this to work. Um, maybe gotten the name wrong. Yeah, I forgot the page. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Namespace view, class HTML view. Anyone see the problem? Didn't I save it? Oh, I didn't save it. Oh. Common problem. OK. So now I get the HTML version of this. And if we look at the source, we can see that the proper strings are inputted in the, or concatenated into the right positions into this. Yes. That was probably it for today. We're going to talk a little more, bit more about views further on, especially the, now we are talk, talked a little bit about the output part. Next time, we're going to talk about the input part, where we get arguments from the user. Uh, but I think that you should make sure that you're registered. You should start with CS quiz and uh, get your working environment started, um, and ask questions during the tutoring sessions. So very happy to have you here. Uh, this 
recorded uh, lectures will be put on the web as soon as possible. Thank you.